when we were children, we used to dream a lot. Uh, when we were children, we used to think about the future. We all expected that one day, one day my life will be different than it is today. And we dreamed of what we wanted to be. And we said out loud things like, I want to be a policeman when I grow up. And then we went to high school or to college, and we didn't just dream about what we were going to be when we grew up. In high school or in college, we really had to start making decisions about what we're going to do to make that dream a reality. What am I going to do when I grow up? And so we chose a school or we chose a program or we chose a major and we chose some sort of path for ourselves to make that dream a reality for us. And then we started our our jobs or we started our careers or we began our families or whatever it was and we grew up. But then as grown-ups, as adults, we stopped thinking about the future and because, you know, well, we're already grown-ups. So we no longer need to think about what we're going to do when we grow up. We're already grown up. And, and besides that fact that we're already grown ups, we also didn't think about the future because we were too busy for that nonsense. We were too busy being grown ups, and adulting is hard for people. And a grown up's life is busy, it's full of responsibilities, and that we never had these responsibilities before when we were kids. We had all time, all kinds of time to daydream. So, who has time to do that sort of thing when you're bogged down with just the responsibilities of day to day? Each day can be exhausting to us. And and who has time to think about the future when we're just trying to make it through each individual day? But what if, what if we're not all grown up? What if there is more growing up that we need to do? So I I brought with you, or brought with me today my glasses to show you. I actually wear glasses. I haven't, uh, most of you probably don't even know that I have glasses because I'm far too vain or and lazy to wear them most of the time. But I have these glasses for my vision, of course, because my vision is not as good as it used to be as a kid. And uh, I used to be able to see much farther than I can see today. And so now that I'm all grown up, the same thing has happened with not just my vision, or not with just my, my eyesight, but with my vision. I've become short-sighted. At the same time, I've lost my ability to see far I've also lost my ability to see far into the future for my own life. And as we get older, not just does our eyesight start to get worse, but our vision gets worse too. Our vision gets worse as our eyesight fades. As grown-ups, we lack vision for the future. As kids, we were, having, we were good at having that, that vision for our future selves, but as adults, we're short-sighted. So in this series, we're calling it When I Grow Up. And I want to challenge us as grown-ups to put on our glasses and to see a little bit farther into the future than we can without them. I want to challenge you to envision the future you. I want to challenge you to, to think about not what you want to be when you grow up, but who you want to be when you grow up. I want to challenge you to have vision for that future you, to, to look into the future and decide now who you want to be then. I want to challenge to you to help you grow as a person, you, because you may be a grown-up, but you've still got growing up to do. You're not all grown up yet. You may be physically grown, but you can still be challenged to grow in other ways. So I want to challenge you this new year, as you put together goals for the new year and resolutions for the new year, as you try to look towards the end of 2019 to figure out what kind of person you want to be at the end of 2019, I want to challenge you to look even farther past just the end of 2019. I want to challenge you to look five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years into the future or till the day you die. Who do you want to be then? Who do you want to be 10 years from now? Who do you want to be on the day that people are talking about you at your funeral? And as we start this new series, this new year, we're going to start with a topic that often tops the list of New Year's resolutions. We're talking about the topic of fitness. We're asking the question, when I grow up, what kind of body do I want to have? I know that doesn't sound very spiritual to talk about fitness in church. So if you prefer, I'm going to use a more churchy term. I'm going to talk about the stewardship of our bodies. Stewardship is a great churchy word, right? You've probably never heard that word stewardship except for in the church. But stewardship simply means management. It means being a good manager. If you're a good steward, you're a good manager. So if you're a good steward of your body, then you're a good manager of it. 
Maybe that still doesn't sound very spiritual to you to talk about that in church. So, it, and, you know, you, a lot of people think, isn't church supposed to be the place that we talk about not our bodies, but our souls? Well, no, not really. We do talk about our souls, but we also talk about our bodies. And that's the way church and Christianity and our religion is different from all these other religions because our future hope is not just that our souls will go to heaven. Not just that our souls will go to heaven. Our ultimate future hope is that our bodies will rise from the grave. That's our ultimate future hope is a physical bodily resurrection. Our religion started also because of a body, because it started with a physical bodily resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. And it ends that way too with bodies. When Christ returns to this earth and physically resurrects the dead from their graves to live eternally in a relationship with him on this new earth. Or, you know, still another objection that you might have to, or Christians might have in talking about the stewardship of our bodies is, you know, you might start to think, you know, heaven sounds really good. Heaven sounds really nice. Heaven sounds a lot better than this world and this life that I'm living right now. So maybe I don't want to stick around until I'm ancient and old and decrepit. Maybe I'd rather get to heaven a little bit sooner. So why should I do anything healthy with my body if that's just going to prolong my entrance into heaven? It's heaven sounds really great now. Now, you probably wouldn't articulate it that way out loud. Uh, we all kind of understand that as, as good as heaven when we die sounds, it, there's something wrong with having a death wish now. Right? We get that. And here's why that is. Here's why we should put off death at, here and now until as long as possible. It's because God made your physical bodies. He breathed into the physical breath of life. God made you and he put you on this earth for a reason, for a purpose. If God wanted you in heaven already, you would be there. But instead, you are here and God didn't think human if God didn't think that human bodies themselves were important, <coughs> then when he created humanity, he would have created us as bodiless souls. He would have started us that way. But no, he creates us with physical bodies. The reality is that God created us physically to live here. And Jesus gives us physical life. He gives us life here on this earth. And God wants us to live this new life in a relationship with himself here. So we have to choose life. We have to choose to make our life, whatever life we have in this body, count. We want to make it a good one for as long as possible. Because God obviously cares about our bodies. After all, he went to all that trouble of creating the physical universe in the first place, forming Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathing into his nostrils the breath of life, and then coming to earth himself in a physical body, Jesus Christ. God himself came in a physical body, and he didn't even let the death of his physical body defeat his body. No, he rose from the dead himself, and he promised to resurrect us and our bodies to new life when he returns. So yeah, I think it's very appropriate. And we talk about the stewardship of this gift that we have, of these physical bodies that God created for us on this physical earth. So we're going to talk about the stewardship or the management of our bodies. So this year, who do you want to be when you grow up, especially as it relates to your body, to, to fitness, to health? What should a Christian want his or her fitness, his or her health to be like when he or she grows up? Well, you may have a lot of fitness goals for yourself personally this new year. You may want to lose 10 pounds or lose 10 inches or run a marathon or start eating right or eliminate sugar from your diet or something like that. Any number of different New Year's resolutions you might have made. But one goal that all Christians everywhere need to have for their fitness is this. When I grow up, I want to be strong enough to serve. When I grow up, I want to be strong enough to serve. So what does that mean? Well, it means three things we're going to talk about today. The first thing strong enough to serve means is that your fitness and your health, it serves a purpose. And that purpose is to serve. So the purpose is not just to look good, it's to do good. It's to serve well. So we should strive for some methodology of fitness that's, that's not just about looking good, but about moving well. It's about not about vanity, it's about ministry. And 
It's about being able to do more work, to be able to do more good, to be able to do more service. It's a functional kind of fitness in that way. It's not about vanity. It's about ministry. Because if you're not taking care of your body, if you're not stewarding your body well, if you're not managing your body well, if you're not paying attention to your own fitness, then you will not be fit to serve others. And actually, if you're not pursuing your own fitness, if you're not pursuing your own fitness, and, and you're actually, then you might actually be more vain than those vain people in the fitness industry, right? Because vanity is thinking about only yourself. But ministry is thinking about serving others. And if you're not thinking about stewarding your body to be strong enough to serve others, then you're only thinking about yourself. You're refusing to allow God to, to use you and your body to serve others. Because listen, sick people can't help sick people. And weak people can't lift up the weak. If you want to position yourself to be able to serve, then you've got to steward your body to be strong enough to serve. And now I know that God can use the weak. That's one great thing about God is God uses all kinds of people, every shape and every size. God uses the weak. I know that God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my power works best in weakness, he says. And I know Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, I take pleasure in my weakness, for when I am weak, then I am strong. But the context there is that neither statement was actually encouraging us to intentionally try to become weak. Neither was it justifying laziness for us. No, Paul said in verse 8 that three different times he begged the Lord to take his weakness away. So when we can train our bodies to be strong enough to serve, we absolutely should. Because sometimes we just don't have that option. Sometimes weakness is all we get. Sometimes physical weaknesses or disabilities are unavoidable to us. Sometimes injury or tragedy can take away our strength, but that still doesn't disqualify us from service according to, to God and according to Paul. Just like Paul told us, God can still use our weakness for his glory, but we should not strive for weakness through our own laziness. You've been given this incredible gift of a functioning human body created by the creator of the universe. So don't waste it. Steward it well. So when I grow up, I want to be strong enough to serve. Strong enough to serve means that I want my fitness to serve a purpose, and that purpose is to serve. And then number two, strong enough then means that good enough now is not good enough. Let me say that again. Strong enough to serve then, like when I grow up, means that good enough now is not good enough. Let me explain. It used to be that as a kid, when you dreamed of growing up, you just knew that as you grew up, naturally over time, you would become bigger and stronger. That's a part of growing up. But as an adult, you should know that over the next 20 or 30 or 40 years of your life, naturally over time, you very well may become bigger, but you won't become stronger. You, will, you won't naturally become stronger. That old man strength is kind of a myth, okay? unless you train it. After a certain age of adulthood, you will start to naturally become weaker. You will naturally lose muscle mass. You will naturally become less flexible. You naturally become slower. This is the reality of being over the hill and sliding down the other side. So, so even though you may feel like, well, right now I'm doing good enough. I'm, I'm in good enough shape today. You may be in good enough shape today. But unless you're putting in the work to continue to build strength and continue to work to become fitter, faster, or stronger, then what, what's good enough today might not last to be good enough tomorrow. So if you want to be strong enough to serve in the future when you grow up, then good enough now is not necessarily good enough for them. So don't settle for mediocrity. Don't settle for the dad bods. Don't settle for just good enough. Challenge yourself to become better. Challenge yourself to make progress. Anyone can make progress of some kind. Everyone can do something to strive for greater strength so that you can become strong enough, not just for today, but for 20, 30, 40 years down the line. Paul tells us that when it comes to serving God with your life, you can't just settle for mediocrity. You can't just settle for good enough. You can't just jog. You, have to, you can't just run fast enough. You have to run to win. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23, I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. 
All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. There's that word purpose again. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So listen, don't disqualify your future self by not training to win today. Don't disqualify your future self from service by not training to win today. When I grow up, I still want to be strong enough to serve. And strong enough then means that good enough now may not be good enough. And then number three, strong enough to serve means that service takes priority over strength. In other words, up until now, I've been challenging you to get into the gym or into some kind of training. Now I'm challenging you to get out of the gym, to use your fitness for service. To prioritize serving over strength. I've been challenging you to make progress on your fitness journey. I've been challenging you to prepare your bodies to be ready for serve to serve. But now, I want to remind you why we're preparing our bodies. And it's for service. So, serve. So, serve. So, help. I don't want to spend all my time in the gym at the neglect of actually serving other people. I mean, the gym right there is a vehicle for us to express my fitness outside of the gym. So sometimes to be a good steward of your body, good manager of your body, you need to get out of the gym and help someone. See, it's easy for fitness to become an idol for a lot of people. It's easy for the routine uh, of working out to become your God. You worship at the altar of, of fitness. But that's obviously not what God wants when it comes to our bodies. He doesn't want us to just become stronger for strength's sake. He wants us to become strong enough to serve. So serve. Look for ways to serve others. Look for ways to help others. Train yourself to be on call for God's mission so that when God calls, you can say, here I am. Send me. I'm ready. I've prepared for this moment. I'm strong enough. Here I am. Send me. Not. Just a minute, God. I've got one more set. Or, I don't have time to do that today, God, because I've got to get that two-hour run training in for my marathon that's coming up. No, if you're constantly turning down opportunities to serve when you're needed because you just can't break away from this idol of a fitness routine, then you're, if you're constantly turning down opportunities to, to serve because you're too sore from the workout the day before, and you've got all, your priorities all backwards, service is why we train. Service takes priority over strength. Strong enough to serve means saying, here I am. Send me. I'm ready. I've prepared for this moment. Are you ready to be sent? Are you ready to serve? Are you ready to be made strong? If you are ready this year to steward your body better in some way, I don't know what your goal might be, then how do you do that? How do you accomplish that goal of stewarding your body well? How do I start stewarding my body better? Well, practically speaking, where do you begin? There are so many different options out there, so many different fitness programs, so many different diets and gyms and boot camps and more. And so it can be overwhelming and intimidating to know even where to begin or how to make progress. So I want to give you just one, one practical piece of advice when it comes to getting started on the journey to become more physically fit or more physically healthy in your body, to being a better steward of your body, to be strong enough to serve others. And that's this. Ask yourself, who do I want to be like when I grow up? Who do I want to be like when I grow up? And then look around you to the people around you and find that person who's just a couple of steps closer to that person that you want to be when you grow up. They're just a couple of steps farther along in their journey of fitness or health than you might be. Not somebody that's super far along, but just a couple of steps farther than you are. Then go to that person and you talk to him or her and you ask that person, what is something that they're doing? What is one thing or two things that they're doing to become as healthy as they are, as physically fit as they are? And then, and this is the important part, do what they're doing. Do what they are doing also. Learn from them, study under them, become a student of theirs, a disciple of theirs in some way, and make progress towards your fitness goal. Find out specifically 
what fit people you know are doing, and then do what they do. Start there. You can always personalize your process, change it up for yourself later on, but start there. That's your starting point. Your starting point is basically getting together with people that you know. Now, that's very much the same strategy that we have for our grassroots groups, for our micro groups. We believe that it's much easier to live this Jesus life when we are surrounded by people who are also already living the Jesus life. And they're not perfect people. They're not idols that we're trying to become. They're just maybe one or two steps further down the journey of following Jesus than you are. And so you can take a few steps towards them and follow in their footsteps. And this is the same reason why Christians have been gathering for centuries and centuries in church on Sunday mornings uh, instead of just watching church online on the live stream. Right? There's, there's value in being near people and coming together with people to talk about following Jesus in their everyday lives, to get advice from other people, to get prayer from other people, to get help from other people, and to give advice to other people and to give help to other people and to, to pray for other people. And this is a great place that we can gather together and we can encourage one another on this journey of life, no matter who we are, no matter how far along we are on our journey, no matter what shape or size we are, no matter if we're a new Christian or a non-believer or a veteran Christian, this is a great place to start your physical fitness journey and your spiritual journey over the next year. Gathering with us every week, gathering in a, in a group, gathering in a micro group, and I especially want to encourage you to come and be with us on Sundays during this, this series called When I Grow Up. As we shift gears, I don't want you to miss next, next week as we change the subject from fitness to faith. So as we close, let me pray for you today. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of life. Thank you for the gift of the air that is filling our lungs. Thank you for this life you've made us for this earth. Thank you for the gift of your son, our God made flesh. God made human. God here with us. Loving God, as we participate in communion today, remind us of your great love for us and the great life that you desire us to live here in a relationship with you. Remind us of your love that caused you to die for us. That your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we could live here and now in a relationship with you. Thank you. Holy Spirit, come and fill this bread and juice and make it be for us like your body and your blood. So as we eat it, we wouldn't just be filled with bread dipped in juice, but we would be filled with with the very Spirit of God, with God's presence within us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.